hello, hello. To our friends in Monroe and Saginaw, hello. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us. We are, we are in our second week talking about peace. Like, what does it mean to find calm in the chaos of life? We started talking about this last week. We're going to keep that conversation going today. And today we're actually going to specifically talk about how do we find peace How do we experience this calm in the chaos specifically related to our families? So here's what I want to do, because I think we've all experienced a little bit of family chaos, even in Monroe and Saginaw. I know if you're watching online, you've experienced this too. And so I actually want to start differently than we normally do. I actually want to start in prayer. I want to start with us kind of just trusting God with our family relationships, just kind of giving that, all the notions we have about what peace in a family is like, I want us to just start by surrendering that to God and then just allowing him to guide us on a journey of what it looks like for us to experience calm in our family chaos. So so let's pray together. God, you are are absolutely incredible. And we, man, we all know what it's like to, to feel the everything from uncertainty to just straight up dysfunction at home. And God, today, whatever that looks like for, for everyone here, God, God, you know what that looks like for me. God, I pray that, that today you open our hearts and our, and our lives and, and that we will trust you with it. God, guide us, give us, give us a, a step to take, give us hope for peace in our families. And may we learn to trust you in new and deeper ways today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, for you, I want you to think about what is that picture of a peaceful family that you have? Because I think we all kind of have a picture in our mind of what a peaceful family should look like, could look like. And then we also have reality, right? Right? And for me, this is like fishing with your kid, especially fishing with a toddler. You have this idea of what it could be like. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. And then you get out there and it's just like you're just putting more worms on the line, untangling, re-rigging the line. That's all you do. You don't actually do any fishing with a toddler. It's just untangling a mess, right? We, we all have a picture of a perfect family, a peaceful family. We all have a picture of a peaceful marriage. And then, and then we, we kind of set out on this journey to, to, to achieve that, to experience that. And somewhere, something happens. Somehow, what, what actually winds up, for many of us, looks a lot more like tangled fishing line, doesn't it? So the question for us today that, that we're going to walk through is, is, especially in our families, how do we experience calm in that chaos, right? If, 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 if our experience of the family tends to lean towards chaos, how do we experience calm in that chaos? And I actually have a one-word answer for this, okay? But you're going to have to bear with me because we're going to play it out over the next, what, 25 minutes or so. But the one-word answer to how do we experience calm in the chaos, especially related to our family, is wisdom. Wisdom. It's through applying wisdom that we can actually experience peace in the midst of the chaos of our lives, our family chaos. And specifically, to be a little more specific, it's not just any sort of wisdom. It's, it's actually a specific sort of wisdom that James, who was the brother of Jesus, okay, let, let that sit in for a moment. James writes, it's wisdom that comes from heaven. Okay, so Jesus, J- James, Jesus' brother, actually wrote a letter to the, to the church in the first century. And, he said, and I, I think that he, he looked at what his brother did with his life, and he said, okay, he, he used some wisdom here. So let me, let me teach people how to live out of this wisdom. And this wisdom, when we apply it to our lives, we can experience calm in the chaos. This is, this is what James writes. He says this. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder 
and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, I'm gonna go back to verse 14 for a moment here because James points out this. He, he talks about bitter envy, selfish ambition. He talks about boasting, denying the truth. And he actually calls this a form of wisdom. He says, this is like earthly wisdom. And when we take these sorts of, of behaviors and we treat them as wisdom, he says, you know what it leads to? Disorder and evil. But earthly wisdom can also lead to things that we crave. You put these things into practice, it could also lead to wealth. Could also lead to power. Could also lead to popularity. That's why it's so enticing. But James is like, look, anytime you see this sort of wisdom, this is what you get. You get chaos. That's what you get. But he says, okay, there's, there's another kind of wisdom. The wisdom that comes from heaven, it, he says it's pure, it's peace-loving, it's considerate, which means that it takes into, into account the needs of, of the people around us. It takes into account the needs of our family. It's submissive, which is the opposite of selfish. It's full of mercy and good fruit, which means not only does it produce this sort of peace it, 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 in, in, in our own lives, it produces it in the lives of the people around us. It's impartial. It's sincere. Man, James is like, man, when I look, when I look at my my brother, and the way he lived his life. This is the wisdom he lived out of. And you know what Jesus was full of? Peace. And you know what people around Jesus experienced? Peace. So James is like, hey, put this into practice. When we put it into practice in our lives, when we put this into practice with our families, you know what we harvest? We harvest righteousness. Which is to say that we, we find ourselves in right relationship with God and with each other. So real, real quick, I just want you to do a quick systems check, okay? Think about your family. Think about your family relationships. How, how close does it, does it model this? This is the wisdom that comes from heaven. If this is kind of what leads to the sort of peace and righteousness in, in our relationships... How are we doing with this? Is it peaceful? Is it submissive? Is it, is it considerate? How are we doing with this? Now, you know what I love about this list? You don't need money to do any of this. You don't even have to be healthy to do this. You don't have to have any sort of position. There's no sort of privilege required. You don't have to be able to put a little perfect picture of your family on the mantle. All you need is wisdom. And it's not even the wisdom that comes from knowledge or experience. It's wisdom that comes from heaven. That, that God gives freely to those who ask. See, James is like, look, look. When we put this into practice, we'll start to see peace in our family. So, how are you doing with this? Just, just quick check. We're going to keep kind of coming back to this. James isn't done. He goes on. I love this next verse. He goes, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Now, here's how I think of desires that battle within us. It's like a bad hot dog. Okay, you ever eat a bad hot dog? Because if you have, you know what a battle within you is like. Right? And when something is battling within us, when a bad hot dog is battling within us, I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's going to come out. It's going to find its way out. And spiritually, when something is off in us, when we got a spiritual bad hot dog in us, it's going to come out. Either we can give it to God and allow him to deal with it, or we let it fester in us and it turns to, to evil and it comes out as chaos. Think about your family relationships. What causes the fights and quarrels? 
among you. Think about your family. Where's this chaos come from? And before you point a finger at someone else in your family, check this. What are the desires that battle within you? One thing that I've been noticing about the quarrels that happen in my home is that almost every single one of them, especially as I've been prepping for this message, almost every single one of them comes from something in me that, that instead of allowing Christ to live through me, my own selfish desires come out. Even last night, man, I was just like, what, what am I doing? What I'm doing is I'm bringing chaos into my family. See, chaos, when we experience it in us, when, when we start to see the fights and quarrels, when we start to see the chaos in our family, you know what, you know what it does? It reminds us that there's something off. It tells us, chaos tells us there's something off. And it ought to tell us, because something's off, you should do something about it. So James is like, yeah, yeah, when, when you experience this sort of battles within you, do something about it. First, bring it to God. Ask him for wisdom. And then put that wisdom into practice. So what James is going to do next is he's actually going to show us that when we start to experience chaos in, in us, kind of, we, we start to witness it or, or, yeah, how it's affecting the people around us, he's going to give us five quick things we can do to put this sort of wisdom into practice. This is what he says. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So I wanna walk through these real quick. Uh, the first one he says here is submit yourselves then to God. You wanna start to experience peace in chaos? Start here. Give up the things you want in order to do what God calls you to do. And on this side of the resurrection, we, we have an example of this. Following Jesus is what it means to submit ourselves to God. In everything, we have the opportunity, because we can know Jesus, to say to ourselves, okay, in this situation, whatever's going on, what does it look like to follow Jesus in this? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You want peace? Follow him. Live like he lived. Start with submitting yourselves to God. And then he says this. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now quick, how often do we actually resist the devil? I mean, just personally, honest. Or do you just invite him on into your life? Invite him on into the relationships? Do we just invite him on into how we spend our time? Spend our money, treat one another. Next time you feel tempted to live out of that bitterness, that envy, that selfish ambition, try this. Try saying, you know what? No, Satan. <laughs> like, no, you're actually not gonna win this. I'm actually not gonna do what, what I want to do in this moment. I'm actually not gonna go there. I'm not gonna actually indulge the flesh. I'm actually gonna resist you. Because James says there's power in that. He says, when you resist the devil, you know what he does? He flees like a coward. You want to start to experience peace, to find calm and chaos. Start by submitting to God, resist the devil. And then James writes this, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. I love this line here, come near to God. Because it's this, this reminder that God is not far from any of us. And I don't know what you've done. I don't know what battles within you. But I know this. God is not far. And if you'll turn, if you'll turn to him, you'll see he's right there, ready to embrace you. All we have to do to come near to God is this. Wash our hands and purify our hearts. And what it means to wash our hands and purify our hearts so spiritually is, is to humble ourselves. Which is why a couple verses later, James says this, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Now last October, my family went to Colorado. We went hiking in the, in the Rocky Mountain National Park. I got a four-year-old son and he's a trooper. He did one day in the mountains seven miles by himself. Didn't want to be picked up. He wanted to do it himself, all right? He's a big boy. 
Well, on the way down the mountain, his legs were tired and he kept falling down and he thought it was funny. So he'd roll around in the dirt and, you know, he was just having a great time. By the time we got down the mountain, he looked like pig pen. Okay. So we go out for pizza after, and I was like, hey, buddy, you got to go wash your hands. He goes, why? My hands aren't dirty. And, and I was like, boy, boy, we could plant a garden in your hands as is right now. Go wash your hands. You're not touching anything until you wash your hands. Okay. When you're four, it takes humility to admit your hands are dirty when it's obvious that they're dirty. Even as adults, it takes humility to admit that spiritually, yeah, our hands get dirty. Yeah, yeah, our hearts tend to drift from the things that are of God. So James is like, yeah, when you come near to God, just wash your hands. Purify your hearts. Humble yourself. Humble yourself in prayer. Humble yourself by confessing what's off in you. Humble yourself in worship. I mean, one of the reasons why we start each of our services with, with songs is, is it, it acts like it's sort of spiritual hand washing. It's one of the ways that we align our hearts and our minds with the will of God. Every time we come near to him, we gotta wash our hands, humble ourselves before him, and he will come near to us. He'll lift us up. You wanna know how to, how, how to apply wisdom that leads to peace? Submit to God, resist the devil, come near to him, humble yourself. And then in verse nine, James says something, I just really love this verse. He says, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. And what he's saying here is start to see your sin the way God sees it. Now, who is ready for the, I can't even believe I'm about to say this, the Detroit Lions home playoff game. Okay, you guys ready for this? It's gonna be awesome, okay? This team has been so fun to root for all year. And one of my favorite things about them is how much they hate to lose. And just all the emotion that's around it. The other, the, a couple weeks ago, when they lost to Dallas, there was a terrible call. You just saw the, the, the anger on like Decker and Coach Campbell. There's just all this emotion. It's like, man, this is why I want to root for you. Okay, what James is saying is all that emotion, that's how God feels about sin. Like he, like, this is so important. Our sin separates us relationally from our heavenly father. It's a death sentence. And sin ought to mess with us. So James is like, here's what you grieve, mourn, wail. It, it actually will lead to a sort of peace. Change your laughter to mourning. Start to see your sin through God's eyes. Remember what your sin cost him. God did not send his son into this world to condemn us, to divide us, to cause chaos in us. He sent his son to save us from the consequence of our sin. And the death that Jesus died on the cross, he died in our place. He took on our chaos. He said, you have my peace. That ought, that ought to make us emotional about our sin. James, James is like, okay, here you go. You want wisdom for dealing with chaos? You want wisdom for dealing with chaos in a way that actually leads to peace? If you, if you put this into practice in your life, you, you'll actually experience a sort of calm in the midst of, of whatever else is going around you. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Come near to God. Humble yourself. See your sin through God's eyes. But this, this leads to peace. It's wisdom. This, this is what Jesus taught and modeled. And if we claim to follow him, it ought to be what we put into practice in our lives. And you know what is true about putting into practice wisdom that leads to peace? Some of the people that are the most difficult to practice being peaceful with are the people who live right in our homes. So how do, how do we take the wisdom that comes from God and apply it in our families? 
How do we apply it in our marriages? How do we apply it in our parenting? If you're, you're a teenager, kid, how do you apply this in the way that you, you, you interact with your parent? Well, luckily for us, the Apostle Paul gave specific instructions for Christians on this. In Ephesians 5 and 6, he actually writes specifically about how to take this godly wisdom that comes from heaven and put it into practice in our family relationships. He actually breaks it down into three different instructions that are pretty much all the same. But he, he first gives instructions for husbands and wives, and then he gives instructions for kids to parents, and then parents to kids. And he starts with, uh, for married people, husbands and wives. So if you're married, you might just want to just tap your spouse if they're here and just say, hey, you don't want to pay attention to this part, okay? This is it's for you. You want to know what leads to peace in your marriage? Here it is. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And you know what? For you married people, I could pack up right now. This, this is... This is the instruction. You want peace in your marriage? Put this in practice. This is, a, this, this is the all of it. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I know none of us like this word here, do we? But this, this is like the third or fourth time it's come up. This, this, is, a tough, this is a tough call because we don't like to submit. This is what James told us to do to God. This is what Paul teaches us to do in our marriages. And when we, one day, in, if you're married, stood in front of someone in a chapel or outside or wherever, you know what we said? Better or worse, rich or poor, sickness, health, the death do us part, I'll serve you as Christ commands. What we did in that moment was we made a promise to submit to put the needs of another person in front of our own. We said, hey, no matter what, I'm, I'm actually gonna bury my selfish desires. And that's not easy for anyone. But I'll tell you what, it's what makes the marriage covenant so beautiful. Yes. To who else, in what other relationship context would you ever say anything like that? There's none. Submit to one another, one another out of reverence for Christ means I'm going to love you like Jesus loves you. I'm going to love you like Jesus first loved me. Selflessly, forever. And here's maybe the hardest. Even if you don't do it back. And why? Why? Out of reverence for Christ. Not because you deserve it. Not because you're perfect. Not because you did the dishes yesterday. Not because you pay the bills. Not because you, you, you keep the house clean, you say nice things to me, buy me flowers. I'm gonna do it out of reverence for Christ. I'm gonna submit to you because the love of Jesus compels me to. You want peace in marriage? Honestly, this is the only instruction that we need. Now, Paul goes on, and if you read the rest of Ephesians 5, he goes on, I think he goes on because we don't like that word. But if you read the rest of chapter five, really what he's saying is that we actually have peace with God because of the self-sacrificing love of Jesus. And he says, your marriage ought to be a picture of that. You want peace in your marriage? Here's what you do. You love one another as Christ first loved you, okay? His next group that he talks to is, is children, which if you're, if you're a teenager, for this context, if you like are dependent on your parents, you count as a children, okay? So he, he writes to children, <laughs> this, is, this is great, you guys get a bonus promise with this. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Children, teenagers, here, here, I'm gonna make it plain for you. Obey your parents, honor your father and mother. That, that, that's, that's the call. You want peace in your relationship with your parents? Actually, he even says, so that it may go well with you. And apparently you live longer if you do this. So <laughs> put, this put this into practice and there's that, that promise. And teenagers, this is especially important for you because here's the thing. When you're a little kid, your parent can pick you up and make you do all sorts of stuff. But when you're a teen, no one can make you do this. You can get discipline. You can get punishment. Who'd you put? You got keys. You got, you got a license. There's, there's some freedom, some responsibility. 
But if you will choose to honor your father and mother, when you choose to obey your parents, the, the promise is you'll have less chaos in that relationship. You'll experience a little more peace. Uh, I, was a, I was a high school pastor here for, for about nine years. And early on in, in my time as a high school pastor, we had a young lady that went to camp with us. And actually, you, you think you'd sign up for camp now. So if you got a teenager, you'd sign up for camp. She went to camp with us, and we actually studied this portion of scripture at camp. And I remember one afternoon, she came up to me, and she was like, look, my, my parents are divorced. I'm really struggling with this because when I go home, I'm going I'm to be with my mom. But my dad, like, I don't even want to be around him. He's an alcoholic. She, I don't have to see him. And I'm really struggling with how do I do this? How do I, like, put this into practice with, with my relationship with my dad? And I remember saying to her, like, I don't know. I don't know. But, but you're asking the right question. And so I told her, hey, here's what I want you to do. When you go home, start to be intentional about going to see your dad. And before you drive over to his house, this is what I want you to do. Just pray and ask God to show you how you can obey him in the Lord. Ask God to show you how you can honor him. And then wherever he leads you, do that. Just, just see if, just see if, Trying to step in this direction does anything. Fast forward seven years later, this young lady's getting married and she invited me to do the wedding. And when those doors opened in the back of the chapel, you know who walked her down the aisle? Her dad. And there's a side of me that was like, maybe this would have happened anyways. But there was a part of me that wondered if the decision she made when she was 17 to begin to heal a relationship that had been broken, to figure out how do you obey and honor a parent that you don't even really want to have a relationship with anymore. He walked her down the aisle to dance together. Children, you, you want peace in your relationship with your parents? Start by asking yourself, man, how can I better obey and honor a father and mother? Just do that, okay? Okay. It's so one more group of people, uh, parents to kids. Now, Paul writes this specifically to fathers, but, but it works for, for parents. He says this, he says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Now that, uh, that word <laughs> exasperate means to frustrate intensely. Paul's like, okay, parents, you should know this, but, but okay, just common sense. Don't intentionally irritate your children. Okay, and we might giggle about this, but every parent that's ever been a parent, you've had that moment, haven't you? Where you know you're intentionally irritating your children. I mean, just last night, this was me, last night, just keep it 100. I mean, I was prepping this message, trying to figure out how I'm gonna teach about this. And it was bedtime for my son, and he wasn't listening, and he had some chaos going on. And you know what I did? When I picked him up, put him on his bed, and you said, you stay here, and you go to sleep. And I went back down and worked on the message. My wife went up and tucked him into bed, and she came back, and she said, you know what he said? He said, Daddy, I wish Daddy wouldn't have grabbed me like that. All of my worst moments as a dad or when there's something in me battling, and instead of allowing the love of Christ to come out, it just, here's my selfish desires. Here's what I want you to do. Do that. Paul's like fathers, dads, parents. Don't do that. Don't do that. Instead, here's what you do. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And what did Jesus do to train and instruct his disciples? He said, love like I have loved Parents, you want peace, or at least to move toward peace in your relationship with your kids? Start to ask yourself in every interaction, what would love have me do? What would love have me do? In, in all of our relationships at home, all of these things, you, you could sum up everything that Paul instructs in families. Love each other as Christ first loved you. It is the love of Christ that centers us on peace in our families. And if we, can, if we can learn what it means to re first receive the love of God and then share that, apply that in our relationships as a family, you know what we get? We get peace. We get righteousness. We don't get removed from the chaos in the world, okay? It's gonna still swirl around us. But what we get, and this is so important, 
It's, it's like this little pocket of calm. Our homes have the opportunity to be like a haven of peace for us, for our kids, for anyone who gets to be invited to be a part of it. So here's what I want to do to, to just close out our time together. I, I honestly just want to give you space to talk with God about how this is playing out in your home. To wrestle with how are your family relationships going? I want to give you time to talk with God about like, is there some chaos that you need to, you need to get out there out in the open? Talk about, I mean, me and my wife had this conversation last night and look, I got some stuff I got to work on. Maybe you just need to say, okay, here's what, maybe you need to look at this list and maybe as I went through this earlier, you're like, you know what? That's the thing for me. That's the thing for me that, you know, that one really got me. I need, I need to actually put that into practice in my life, in my family, Here's what I want you to ask. I want you to, what is the next step for your family in finding peace? We've actually put together a, a little tool to, to help you on a journey to discover this. Um, if, if, you, if you go on, on the website, I think we got a QR code here. We've got this, we've got this kind of tool that will help you work through Kind of what does peace look like? What's the next step in peace look like for you? There's three steps to it. The first one is about encouraging each other. The second one asks you to work through some questions that, that will help you actually come up with a step or a few steps you can take to, to experience peace or, or to at least move in that direction. And then the third step kind of walks you through how to pray together. If this is useful for you, if, please download this, work through this. And I wanna give you time to pray. Just right in the space you're in. And maybe if your family's together here, Maybe you take this time and circle up. Maybe you feel alone in this. And you're like, man, I, I, I wanna, I'm almost worried about working through some. This is gonna stir up some stuff. We're gonna have people in the room that will pray with you. Don't, don't, don't go through this alone. Talk with someone, ask, ask someone. Hey, will you work through this? We wanna help you take a next step in finding peace in the chaos of your family. So I'm gonna pray for us and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some space to, to just talk to God. So let's, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for stepping into the mess we created, the mess we're in. Thank you for not seeing our chaos and dismissing us or pushing us away. Thank you for for calling us to come near to you, for guiding us, for instructing us, for giving us an example in Jesus. God, may we learn to trust you with, with some of the really tough mess. May we learn to trust you with where you're leading us to. So God, guide us. Give us the courage to take the steps you call us to. Give us people, bring them around us, God, to guide us, to help us, to, to journey with us. In Jesus' name, amen.